Hi again everyone. Now I will continue looking at Ulf Andersson's examples following the really beautiful book uh, called uh, Grandmaster Chess Strategy from Kohlfeld and Kern. Um, uh, they analyze Ulf Andersson's games, uh, extremely instructive parts of his career. Um, so now I will have a look at some of his games that involve the Catalan opening with whites. So this opening is characterized by um, uh, more or less the following moves, um, basically involving you know putting the bishop on the long, long diagonal to have a long-lasting pressure on the queen side. Now this this Catalan is a special opening because it favors those players, those technical players that love to go into end games and they love to hold long-lasting pressure on black. It, the advantage might be small, but it's long-lasting and it involves few risks of losing. And Ulf Andersson is a perfect example uh, of such strategy because he loves and games, he loves simple, clear plans and he loves long lasting pressure. Now, he really obtained a lot of good uh, results with his opening, as we will see. Now, we are looking at his game, the game against Ivanov uh, in 2000, Swiss team championship. Now, as we will so often see in this, in this opening, Black will solve his problems with his bishop by pushing b5, but a6 and b5 will also create some weaknesses around the queen side, you know, which Wolf Anderson will exploit in the end. So in his choice with, with Catalan with white, he allows Black to play a6 and b5. He does not play a4 himself, because that's like modern theory now, um, that white plays a4 himself just not to allow this a6, b5 and bishop b7 development. But Ulf Anderson proves that this structure, uh, even though it seems completely symmetrical, uh, and black solved this problem with the bishop on c8, still allows white to play for some advantage because of these weakenings around the, on the queen side with this pawn structure. That's extremely instructive to see. So if you give this position to the computer, perhaps it will uh, just say, you know, it's completely equal. Uh, because I mean now look at the mass exchanges now we'll see so many pieces will get exchanged in this line uh, You might wonder what is white playing for? I mean basically with every move there's an exchange and this is also another exchange So it's just Wolf Anderson is going to this end game with knight versus the bishop. It's extremely instructive uh, You know sometimes these endings are called or sort of these knights are called Anderson knights uh, in this pure you know knight versus bishop endings where knight is dominating the bishop, or knight is an advantage over the bishop. Um, it's called Anderson knights. Uh, you will see uh, how he employs uh, this piece to gain an advantage over the bishop. Now, why is a knight a better piece uh, compared to bishop in certain lines? Well, the idea is simply that bishop can only control dark squares, while knight can, you know, knight is a flexible piece. It can go to any square. To control both color complexes so in situations like that knight might have an advantage over the bishop despite there are pawns on both sides but in this particular situation black's task is a little bit more difficult because he already had some weaknesses uh, namely you know the, the pawn on h7 is weak and there are double pawns here also you know this a6 pawn might be a weakness as well uh, in some lines thanks to this you know a6 b5 idea uh, in, in in the beginning uh, but again objectively this might be an equal position but white is sort of on the better side of this equality, so to speak. Now, this is also interesting. Ulf Andersson is redeploying this knight. Uh, it, there's nothing to do on the C, on the C3 um, because it was blocking the, the rook. And now comes the first plan. Black is logically placing the bishop on this long diagonal, putting his, his pawns on the light squares, uh, arguably making this bishop a, a good bishop. And yet this bishop is lacking targets, you know, after B3, after the move b3, this bishop does not have any clear targets to play for. And meanwhile, you know, white king is extremely fast in joining the game. That's also one of the issues with uh, with Catalan. Namely, after this exchange of the bishops on g2, our king can enter the game in the end game very, very quickly. It's closer to the center. You know, these are these sound like all little nuances, but if you add them up, then you know, white might have an advantage in this position, a slight advantage, of course. Uh, but it might not be so easy to play with this position with black because you are lacking clear targets. Now, Ulf is 
queen the king to e2 just to just to be able to play knight e2 to get this knight into the game again. Meanwhile, black is putting the king uh, to a more centralized square, just stopping rook invasions on the c file. Now this is interesting. You see, when I then I told you that knights are flexible pieces. That's what I'm talking about. Knight is sort of having some rooms here to to uh, root himself to a better square. Namely, it will be d3. It will be extremely interesting to see in many many Catalan endings. Um, the knight will go to d3 to have a dominance over this bishop. And why is this d3 square so important? Because it will basically cut, take away some of the entry squares of the of the opponent king. And if you sort of in conjunction with the e4 idea, then you know all these light squares will be taken care of as well. So this you will see that this duo will be uh, really nice. Uh, will make a good cooperation basically. So this is an interesting decision. Black is exchanging the rooks because it was already getting too much on the c file. Um, so he's going to this pure bishop versus knight ending, which becomes extremely instructive now. As I said, knight e3 is important. It cuts the king from joining the, the center. Now obviously you cannot play king d5 here because knight b4 collects the pawn on a6. Right. So after a5, e4 is a very instructive move as well. Just taking this uh, square from the king, just creating a barrier. Um, and of course also allowing king e3 next. Our king has plans of, you know, going to the king side and attacking this weakness on h7 in some lines. Now, it might be an objectively equal position, but it's already getting difficult to play this position with black. And why is that? Because, you know, you have a weakness on h7 and arguably later on b5, while we are lacking completely, we are lacking targets uh, as white. And you always have to stop our, our king to, to enter the position, right? So in that sense, king d6 might not be the best move. Perhaps e5 was called for, but e5 is kind of an ugly move to make because you're sort of killing your own bishop. But obviously in this situation, this is important because you're not allowing uh, king f4. And king d6 perhaps would you know, keep equality from the black side. But it's kind of a passive defense uh, from the black side, right? The whole idea is just to not not give white king and sort of an entry square on the king side, namely f4. In this situation, it will be an equal position, basically. But one can understand, after, you know, suffering like a long, long game, trying to defend, you might miss such nuances. Now, g5 is important just to create a square for the king. And also fixing this pawn on, on h7, fixing the weakness on h7. Now black tries to defend uh, the king side with the king, and Anderson is just taking his time with in small improvements like this f3, and now comes f6. So maybe you should stop your video and find the best move here for white. Like how would you continue this game? Uh, I mean, obviously white has plans of infiltrating the, the enemy camp. That will be a hint. Um, but you know, Black's idea is understandable. He wants to exchange this this pawn that is sort of cramping Black's position. King h5, very interesting pawn sacrifice. Well, Anderson tries to infiltrate with the king at the cost of a pawn, like this. And after King g8, his idea is to play Knight c5. Knight, now this Knight is also very annoying. Uh, it's attacking this weakness on e6. And if you're not careful, then it might also collect this pawn on, on b5. So this knight is already, you know, annoying black. While black is sort of tied up in defending these pawns, it might still be objectively equal position here. But as you might see, it, it becomes depressing to play this position with black. You have to be precise in finding the only moves here. Um, so he played king f7. Perhaps e5 was an idea, but it's not really great because knight e7 comes, as I said. Now this pawn is also weak. And also, yeah, you're losing the pawn on g5. So this would be a huge advantage for, for white. Uh, probably just winning. Um, so king f7 was played. Now king takes h7. Now bishop b6. Um, it's interesting. Maybe bishop f6 was a little better here. Instead of bishop b6, perhaps bishop f6. Knight goes back to d3, but the bishop sort of infiltrates. Uh, the position a little bit, just defending this pawn on g5. But you see, I mean, knight is very flexible. It can go to any square in the board, while this, this you know, black has to find the only defensive resource. It might be enough for black to save equality, just to keep the bishop on d2, 
just defending this pawn and not allowing, importantly, not allowing our king to, to get active. But as I said, it was already getting difficult to, to find these only moves at this stage of the game. Right, now it's interesting. Anderson will root the king like this to, to, to the queen side. Uh, it's one of the most peculiar uh, king walks to me. Uh, like after taking a lot, of, a lot of time to go there, now white king will go to the other side. And black tries to sort of keep your position, but you will see it's not uh, sustainable. Right, this is interesting. King went all the way to c8. Um, and obviously, black king has to take care of this pawn on e5. That's why you cannot keep the opposition. Now he played bishop e3. It turns out that bishop d4 might be a little better um, here. Just keep the opposition like this. White sooner or later has to play b4, I guess, to play for, for advantage. And this is the only way to save the draw for black. But as you see, it's not the most intuitive defensive resource because it involves giving up your bishop for the for the pawn, but entering the king and pushing this pawn. This would give black enough resources to, to save the draw here, like this. White has to give up the knight for the pawn. And this is an equal endgame. But it was so hard to calculate from afar, right? This is the only defensive resource, but you have to calculate this already from this position, right? So it's this really means that black is a depressing task at hand in such endgames. So he played bishop e3 instead. King b7, now bishop d4, but as you will see, this is already getting too late. Now b4 is an important move. And after b4, everything works for white. Um, so black just missed that small chance of you know saving the draw uh, with that move. He played king d7, and if he plays king bishop e3, for example, then white's idea is just to attack and pick up this pawn. Or this pawn, right? Black king is tied up, basically. Um, so after b4, king d7 was played. And here, perhaps black missed this important move, knight c5 check. And the idea is that, of course, you cannot take the knight because then our, our pawn will promote. So king d6 is the only move, and then comes king b6. And importantly, you cannot defend your pawn on b5. And this is already a losing position for black. Uh, he resigned after a few moves. Like here, he resigned after king a6 because there's no stopping... Uh, there's no stopping this uh, movement of this pawn, basically, right? So it's it's a depressing position for black. But what can we learn from this game? I mean, Anderson really put long-lasting pressure on his opponent. He didn't avoid these exchanges, mass exchanges, because he knew that he would still keep some pressure in this in this endgame, uh, thanks to this beautifully placed knight on d3, just cutting off uh, entry squares uh, for black, and in conjunction with this active king, right? Um, and black missed few chances, like here, black missed, for example, um, the move e5. But as I said, it's they are not the most intuitive moves to make, uh, because you're sort of killing your own bishop. So black's task was difficult, practically difficult, uh, here. Even though, objectively, it might be an equal position. Also here, like, finding this resource was extremely instructive. Just putting the pressure to black. Yeah. And, I mean, maybe the only only resources already here are bishop f6, but again, uh, practically, it was not the most obvious defensive resource to find. And already after this position, just watch out, this king is marching to the other side of the board. It's just amazing. And it's all about, you know, this, this barrier that is created by the pawn on e4 and, and the knight on, on d3, just not allowing any entry squares for the, for the black king. And as you will see, this knight on d3 will win a lot of games uh, for Anderson. Also for Anatoly Karpov, he has he won a lot of games like this, uh, with a beautiful knight on d3, uh, sort of creating an advantage on, on these end games. Uh, I think it was ex extremely instructive to, to see. This game was beautifully, beautifully done by Wolf Anderson. So I will have a look at some of the other, other Catalan examples. I think because I'm, I'm a Catalan player myself, I need to study these, these games to to improve my uh, skills in this in this in this end game but what it takes in in such games is that you know you don't care about exchanges as long as you can keep the long lasting small edge until the end of the game and if your opponent cannot sustain that level of 
alertness, then you might win a lot of games uh, like this. So that's one of the advantages of playing this opening with white. Thanks.